I'm Andy, and I'm a central banker. <laughs> Wasn't actually a joke, but thank you. Um, <laughs> so, so my job is to try and understand the economy, uh, and then to set interest rates to try and make the economy grow. That's what I do. Um, back in 2015, I was in uh, Nottingham, in the Midlands of England, uh, talking to people about the economy. And the data back then suggested the economy was actually doing pretty well. Uh, jobs were being created. Uh, incomes in the economy were back above the level they'd been before the crisis. We were in an economic uh, recovery. So my first stop in Nottingham was with a, a set of local businesses, a round table. And over lunch, I spoke to those businesses about the economic recovery. They nodded along. Some were awake. Uh, one or two were even sober. Um, <laughs> and at the end, they threw me a few polite questions, and we all left uh, happily. Uh, next, stop, next stop was a round table, not of companies, but of charities. Homelessness charities, food banks, mental health charities. Now, my institution, the Bank of England, had never spoken to charities before. This was an experiment. But I thought, maybe they'll provide a somewhat different window uh, on the world. Well, I was 30 seconds in uh, to my talk about the economic recovery when, somewhat to my surprise, a hand went up. And the person said, um, I don't wish to be impolite. Now, that's always a clue, right? Uh, <laughs> I don't wish to be impolite, but what the hell are you talking about? What the hell? None of the people I've come across in the last three or four years have remotely experienced a recovery. They've gone backwards over that period. And then we went round the table, and each charity in turn told their story with the self-same bottom line. Economic recovery was not in the lived experience of anyone in that room, not even close. I left the room, a bit bruised, a bit perplexed. When I got back to London, though, I asked my economists, of which there are many, just look again at the numbers. Just look and see whether, although the UK as a whole had recovered, were there one or two towns or cities that hadn't? For example, Nottingham. And they came back to me later that day and said, yes, actually there were one or two places where there hadn't been any recovery. I said, uh, which ones? Uh, and they said, Scotland. Uh, <laughs> all of Scotland. Yeah, all of Scotland. Any others? They said, uh, yeah, there's um, also Wales. Um, <laughs> And Northern Ireland. Um, Scotland, well, uh, and England, is it, well, one or two places there too. Um, there's the southwest of England. Um, there's East Anglia. Uh, the Midlands, that explains Nottingham, by the way. Uh, and also, there's the northwest of England and the northeast of England. <laughs> so, hang on. So that means then nowhere's recovered uh, apart from London and the southeast. And they said, Andy, you've got it, you know, well done. Um, <laughs> pretty patronizing economists, actually. Uh, <laughs> so how'd that happen? Wow. How has that happened? How could it be that a set of non-experts in charities had told me more about the economy than all those economists, all those company bosses I'd been speaking to? Well, the answer is now obvious to me, actually. And that's because those people are the economy. Their lived experience, spending, saving, working, is what makes the economy tick. If we are to understand the economy, we must find ways of tapping in to that lived experience of the ordinary citizen. And the period since, that is just what I 
have been trying to do. Tapping into those conversations that never previously we've tapped into. I can tell you, hand on heart, I've learned more from those conversations than I ever could have from any spreadsheet or any chart. I've learned from community workers in Cardiff how a rise in the cost of living is for them a sharp choice between heating or eating. I've learned from parents in Newcastle how they receive through their door every day more loan leaflets than pizza leaflets. I've learned from tenants in Blackpool how in 21st century Britain we still have urban slums and drug dens calling themselves a housing market. I've learned from pensioners in Airdrie how, as their bank branch has closed, that access to their money in their bank account is not a nice to have, it is a basic human right. I could go on. And none of this is to say that experts and expertise aren't needed. Of course they are. For complex choices, you need experts and you need expertise. But equally, it is always the case that expertise is enhanced by tapping in to the views of non-experts. And why is that? Well, that's because those non-experts bring diversity of the two E's. Diversity of experience and diversity of expertise. And those two E's, in turn, give rise to two C's, namely creativity and challenge. And they, in turn, are the wellspring of good, effective decision-making in complex environments. There is wisdom. There is wisdom in crowds. And the bigger the crowd, and the more diverse the crowd, the greater that wisdom. There is more collective wisdom in this audience today than there is standing on this stage by many orders of magnitude. That begs the question then, that begs the question, how best are we to tap into this folk wisdom? Well, um, this is a question that's engaged theorists uh, and philosophers for many, many millennia. Uh, and without there being a, an optimal answer, uh, the model that many modern democracies have alighted on is one of so-called executive democracy. Here's a schematic of it. Uh, that involves taking either elected or designated experts and using them to make decisions on behalf uh, of society. That's the way the Holyrood and Westminster parliaments run. It's also, actually, the way in which we set interest rates across the UK. That's designated to a set of experts, of which I am one, on a thing called the Monetary Policy uh, Committee. Here we are. I think you'll agree you'd have to travel a very considerable distance to find a more diverse set of white, <laughs> middle-aged, middle-class men than those. Um, now, that is not um, to denigrate the process, that, far be it from me. Um, but could it be improved by tapping in to that non-expert wisdom, by seeking to bridge what has become a great divide between public institutions like mine and the public uh, you? Well, what alternative models might there be? Well, here's one. Uh, and that is to place decision-making directly in the hands of the public themselves, what goes by the name of a direct democracy, making decisions, every decision, through a sequence of referenda. Now, um, now is not the time. Uh, <laughs> for reasons of job preservation. Um, 
to get into the, the, the whys and wherefores of referenda. But, but the UK does have, I think you know, recent experience of a referendum. <laughs> and without taking sides, um, I mean, the outcome there uh, divided uh, the nations. Uh, it, for me, debased the very notion of democracy. And certainly, uh, the results uh, were contrary to the will of a great many people. And um, I refer, of course, to the 2016 uh, referendum uh, to name the Royal Research Ship. <laughs> Here it is. Um, now, several perfectly respectable names were put forward. Um, the Sir David Attenborough, the famous naturalist, uh, the Sir Ranulph Fiennes, the famous explorer, uh, and Pingu, the famous cartoon penguin. But no, none of those. In a, in a direct democratic process, uh, the public instead uh, opted uh, for this, which was <laughs> Boaty, Boaty McBoatface. Um, so that there is wisdom in crowds, but Sometimes there is madness too, right? Sometimes there's madness. Um, given that, flaws in executive democracy, flaws in direct democracy, is there a third way? I will argue that there is. And it goes by the name deliberative democracy. He's a schematic of it. Sounds new. It is not. It is not. For many people, uh, ancient Greece, Athens, was the very birthplace of democracy, and the Athenian notion of democracy involved convening citizens in public fora, in citizen panels or juries, to make decisions, to deliberate on the key societal issues of the day, economic, political, social. And of course, when it comes to the criminal justice system, we're all accustomed to using citizens' juries to make those complex choices, using non-experts to reach citizens' verdicts on key societal issues. Right up to date, we have recently in Australia using citizens' juries to opine, deliberate, and devise solutions to issues as vexed as Aboriginal rights. And the key issue then is, could that same approach be used in understanding the economy and the setting of interest rates? Well, we're about to find out. Because today, at TEDx in Glasgow, the Bank of England will be hosting the first trial citizens panel. Indeed, probably the first citizens panel ever in the UK to discuss an issue of national importance. This is the latter-day equivalent of that Athenian forum, only with fewer togas. <laughs> and this is no one-off. This will be start of a regular sequence covering all parts of the UK at which we engage with public the public in dialogue on the economy. And we feed back to them on how we are taking into account uh, their opinions. As was mentioned, um, you can look, join this conversation yourselves through that hashtag, hashtag BOE uh, asks. I hope as many of you as possible will join and provide your wisdom in helping us set policy. Let me end. Is there wisdom in crowds that people like me can learn from? Absolutely there is. Will that help? in understanding the economy collectively, in setting interest rates to improve the economy, I think it will. Will that make for better outcomes in society? Will it be, lead to a greater sense of recovery among charities in Nottingham, improved incomes for community workers in Cardiff, improved access to credit for those parents in Newcastle, improved housing for those tenants in Blackpool, improved banking for those Airdrie pensioners, better engagement 
by the general public in the setting of policy, including in this room. I hope so. We can put democracy back into public decision making. We can put the public back into public policy. And we can close that great divide between public institutions, me, and the public, you. We need, we can, and we will. And that conversation starts right here, right now. Thank you all for listening.